But we're going to check in now with Stephen Sangster. If you've listened to the show for a while, you'll know that we cover all sorts of countryside stories across the county. And Stephen is the owner of an ancient woodland here in Kent who has been surveying the wreckage this afternoon. How's it going, Steve? (laughs) Yeah, pretty good. And I'm I'm pleased to say I wouldn't uh, describe it as a wreckage, uh, fortunately. Um, But yeah, certainly on Friday when all the storm warnings are coming, um, a little bit nervous about, uh, you know, what state the woodland will be in. And uh, uh, pleased to say it went down today, really. And we we have lost a few trees, um, but the ones that have gone are pretty diseased and rotten already. So uh, um, I, I think uh, I think we've been quite lucky. But driving around Kent today, I have seen quite a few large trees go over as well. So I know it's a different story all around the county. And how does it feel, Steve, as a as an owner of an ancient woodland, when we hear these weather warnings and the fact there's a storm approaching, you must feel so helpless in that situation. You do, because, I mean, I, I, I sort of tend to go down to the wood once a week. Um, so, you know, last weekend, there wasn't really much talk of this uh, approaching storm at all. And then the sort of news stories build about it. But to be honest, you know, we, we've taken the woodland on as a as a, as a project to kind of regenerate it, restore it, uh, and for nature. Um, so storms are very natural processes. And actually, um, for a lot of woods, it can be, um, you know, a great benefit um, to it, you know, because it creates a lot of dead wood. And we we struggle, actually, with our woodlands here and around Kent. You know, a, a natural woodland would typically have about 40% dead wood in it. Um, but actually, a lot of surveys done in Kent, in our parks and and sort of our managed woods have shown actually it's about 10%. Um, And of course that dead wood is vital actually to the ecosystem of of the woodland. Um, You know, be it the the standing dead wood that is used um, by nesting birds and bats, right down to the leaf litter and the twigs on the floor that are home to, you know, thousands of, you know, uh, invertebrates and, um, you know, birds and small mammals that then live on, those insects as well. The whole ecosystem relies on this dead wood. So actually a few branches, a few trees down in in a woodland can do it uh, uh, a world of good. So it is a case of keeping that tree in place for years to come to let it rot slowly away and and let the animals and the wildlife take over. Yeah, and it's it's a really hard thing to do because I think as humans we have a natural instinct to tidy, to structure, to make things safe all the time. Apart from my children, they don't have that instinct, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but um, the best thing we can do, actually, is often, you know, if it's safe to do uh, do so, is to leave it in place and you let, let nature, um, you know, take advantage of it. And many may be listening, Stephen, thinking, well, what is Steve doing as the owner of an ancient woodland? What was it that drew you to this forest, Steve? Well, I saw a for sale sign <laughs> driving past one day, um, and uh, always loved the outdoors. Um, I like making things from wood, and I love wildlife. And I thought all those things combined, um, it could be a great little project. Um, so that was it. We sort of dived in about seven years ago as a family, um, and we've not looked back since. Really, it's a beautiful ancient woodland, uh, bluebells in spring, um, and we've been sort of blown away really with the whole journey and the things we've discovered. Um, along the way in the community of other woodland owners that we've we've met as well. What's your aim for the woodland? What what purpose, for what purpose did you buy the woods? There's no real sort of purpose in mind, actually. Um, we were we were saving for a lofter conversion at the time uh, because we have our in-laws coming to stay quite a lot. Um, and um, they built a hotel at the end of the road. <laughs> I thought, well... They'd be more comfortable in the Premier Inn than than our loss. So we had a bit of money um, to spare, and uh, I thought where to put it. And I thought, well, land is a good investment, um, and there's not many assets you can buy really that you can get a lot of enjoyment from as well. Um, and the wood has certainly certainly been that. Um, but um, it's just been an eye opener, really. Um, not not just when we're there and the sort of experience we have there, but I've set up these nature cams around the wood so we can see what happens when we leave as well. Because uh, you wouldn't believe the sort of wildlife that comes out and some of the strange behaviours you, you, you kind of see in the wood. Um, it really opens your eyes to 
actually, you know, how nature really depends on a thriving woodland. And what have you noticed? Because I know that you, you often post online on your Instagram account all sorts of happenings on your nature cam at night and you've noticed a really unexpected friendship forming. Yeah, this is a heartwarming story for a gloomy Sunday. Yeah, we sure um, do need it, that's for sure. <laughs> um, so, you know, a lot of our creatures in the woodland uh, live underground. Uh, very sensible, actually, in this sort of weather. Um And I noticed a new hole had appeared uh, in a a new part of the wood. Uh, So immediately I sort of set the camera up to point on the hole, see what's going on. So I left it there for a couple of weeks. And then um, a couple of weeks ago, I picked the camera up. I think it was Valentine's Day, actually, I downloaded it, which was quite um, funny. Because um, we discovered that it appeared that there was a badger and a rabbit living or co cohabiting in this hole together. Uh, over the two weeks, there were numerous clips of them coming in and out at different times. Um, and I thought, surely not. Um, no. A badger and a rabbit sort of living together. And I, so I, I sort of went online, did a bit of research on it, and um, apparently it does happen. It's quite rare, um, but they have been known to share a set. Um, maybe this sort of stormy weather forced them to, to live together. I don't know. but. Um, Apparently, it's more common for foxes and badgers will often be seen to share a set, but uh, a rabbit and a badger. Um, yeah, but yeah I'm not quite sure how the relationship... Wouldn't a rabbit be you know, in danger sometimes of the badger? Uh, apparently not a grown rabbit, but um, oh. the the, um, the babies yeah. uh, can be a target for badgers, so I don't know how long this uh, relationship might last. And you sent this footage in to Chris Packham. <laughs> Yeah, um, he's been quite interested in some of the stuff we've done, actually, in the wood. I, a couple of years ago, I I, I put all my favourite clips together, that I'd, uh, sort of nature clips that I'd uncovered in the wood, into sort of a three-minute little montage, uh, which he loved, and he shared it out with his followers. Um, oh. So I was hoping he might have some gems on this latest sort of relationship that's formed in the wood, but he hasn't got back to me yet, but I know he's a busy man. Yeah, he might be able to share his expertise and actually, you know, how this relationship might work and if it's happened before. Absolutely fascinating, isn't it? When you see different creatures form these friendships. I mean, we see it at the sanctuary with just the rescue and the rare breed animals that we have. I've got a, a huge young horse that's growing bigger by the week, Steve. You wouldn't believe it. I think actually I've got <laughs> suspicions that she may be part shire horse unexpectedly, which oh is God. quite a horror to myself and my mum as she grows taller and towards town over us but she is actually best friends with one of our sheep or one of our rescue sheep uh, that was a bottle fed lamb and he's grown up around the horses and it's quite fascinating because you can see the sheep that have sort of grown to like the horses over the years and sort of you know there's, there's that caution in their eyes there's that wariness of the power of the beast and you know how they've sort of terrorized the sheep over the years in a way by not letting them share the food and and establishing their territories but with Jim our rescue lamb who has literally been this tiny baby around our biggest horse he will go he'll weave through her legs he'll shortcut under her stomach he has no (laughs) care for her humongous dish bowl like feet uh, her hooves that could just sort of crush him in an instant and he will just go side by side he'll try and share the dinner and the food together they'll feast they'll sort of go up and nuzzle each other he'll follow her around if she goes for a gallop he'll join in and try and keep up and it's just fascinating how he's got absolutely no care or caution in the world he just sees it as her friend he's even learnt her body language and her signalling so they can communicate as well so it it's is incredible. really interesting isn't it watching how, how pets or nature or farm animals or livestock can create these unlikely friendships yeah there's a growing sort of um, piece of, uh, sort of scientific um, um, sort of research I think they call it mutualism um, about how nature sort of helps each other. I mean, we, we know traditionally there's been lots of um, kind of support, you know, whether it's the insects that are helping pollinate the flowers or, you know, the foxes that eat the berries and then go and, um, um, you know, feed it elsewhere in the forest. There's been lots of these sort of mutual um, kind of relationships in nature, but actually it's only through studying them uh, closely um, that you actually uncover new kind of forms of relationships that are kind of unexpected. And, and maybe this badger and this rabbit uh, forms into that category. But 
You it know, must bring you great joy, enough. Steve, to check your camera and see what gems you might have <laughs> captured in the well, night. Yeah. Um, so you pick your camera up and you might have up to sort of 300 clips to go through. Um, so we download it on the computer. My kids are excitedly there as well, wondering what we'll find. Um, it's mostly squirrels, pigeon, squirrel, pigeon. <laughs> and then suddenly you, you see a beautiful deer or something. Um, and uh, the excitement of downloading that and then sort of editing it into a nice little clip. You've probably seen some of my little videos. I've put some background music on as well. To, I have. They're um, beautiful. To add to it. Oh, no, well, I mean, what's next for you, Steve? So will you be having to go around and will you check the woodland in its entirety for storm damage or do you just accept it's part and parcel of what happens within the forest and see what happens next? Yeah, I mean, you, you, you kind of monitor it and make sure it's safe, but um, probably a lot of your listeners don't realise actually how uh, resilient our trees are and what sort of mechanisms they deploy to protect themselves from storms. It's really quite interesting. Um you know, they, as they're growing, they will learn the prevalent wind direction, which for us in Kent is southwesterly, mm-hmm. and they will grow accordingly. So they'll anchor their roots in to make sure they're protected from that prevalent wind. They will grow so their weight leans into the wind. And you've got some species like oak that, as they grow, they will lower their branches, to give themselves that stability, and that's why they're so successful oaks um, in surviving. And even trees will work together as a forest to to protect themselves against storms. So you often find um, at the forest edge, you've got the smallest, fattest trees, and they, 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 they sort of uh, become taller and thinner as you go into the middle of the forest to create this sort of um, aerodynamic effect oh, wow. to protect the whole woodland, um, which is quite amazing. So, yeah, overall, um, you know, we, we thought it could be a lot worse. Um, but I think this storm has shown that you... You sometimes get these ancient or more veteran trees that come down and mm-hmm. people can get quite upset because, you know, a lot of these trees have been around for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And we certainly had one example here in Alpington where I live uh, in the local park where a, a huge oak went over on Friday um, and the whole community came out um, to see it the following day. Um, it was almost like the wake, the wake for oh. this uh oak tree because uh, in some respects it was really sad you know had lots of little buds on it um, ready to spring into life as it has for the last sort of 300 years uh, but no more it just lies there um, and it got the whole community out and talking and we're thinking you know it'd be a real shame to to not make more of this tree uh, unfortunately it has fallen over two paths and a, a drainage ditch so I don't think it can be left for nature but um We've got a great local councillor, uh, Chris Pierce, who um, has already been in touch with the council to say, look, could we do something with this uh, particular oak tree so it lives on? Um, and there's a, a local charity has been in touch, um, London Reclaimed. Um, they take sort of windswept trees, some of these big, beautiful trees that unfortunately come over in, in parks um, and turn them into furniture. Wow. They've got a subsidiary called Goldfinch Furniture, I think it's called. Um, and they uh, they they kind of mentor and support young people who can't um, uh, find jobs um, and help them turn some of these specimens into furniture uh, and sell them. And that, the profits from that then go into helping their careers and starting their own businesses. So I thought it would be lovely if, if we could turn this tree into some beautiful local furniture, dining room tables or even the kitchen, so it can live on locally. Oh, what a lovely idea and, and what a way to turn around a, a sad and depressing situation. Like you say, I mean, I've seen so many posts on social media, people mourning, you know, the, the trees that have gone over in their garden. Some people, you know, have been blessed to have one tree on their, in the middle of their lawn or, at the you know, the perimeter and are so sad to see it go. Um, and it, and you think, what can we do? What can we make of this situation? So what yeah. a wonderful way to turn it around. Trees can have a lot of special meanings to people, particularly sort of in your garden. I, when my father died about seven years ago, um, my work colleagues bought me a lovely magnolia tree, which I planted in the front. So every spring now, when it comes into blossom, beautiful, obviously magnolia has fantastic displays. It reminds me of him, and I thought, that's a lovely thing. You know, so I'd be devastated if I lost that, for example. 
Um, but trees can live on, you know, whether it's furniture or recycling it back into nature. Um, it's not all lost. Um, um, so we shouldn't mourn it too much. Stephen, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and your expertise and, and your thoughts and processes of what's been happening in your forest and in your community during the storm. It's been absolutely fascinating. Come back on the show soon, won't you? My pleasure. And yes, I'd love to be back. So uh, enjoy the rest of your show. For those listening Thanks who want too. to check out your nature cam on Instagram, where can they find you? Uh, if they go to billet, that's B-I-L-L-E-T, dot wood, they can see all the strange adventures uh, we get up to. <laughs> Steve, thank you. Come back soon. We love hearing your updates out deep in the forest and also getting that insight into the trees and the community as well and, and just realising the attachment we have to the fauna and the foliage in our area. Yeah, it does hit hard, doesn't it, when we lose them? So thank you, Steve. You're listening to me, Anna Louise, here on BBC Radio Kent.